A research team is in pursuit of one of the least known great apes on Earth. A newly discovered population of western lowland gorillas. Their goal is to make contact. The team calls out to identify itself. The gorillas have learned to fear hunters, and that fear can spark aggression. We're in a bad spot between the gorillas and the fruit and trees. There's one there to your left, okay? We're getting ready to ambush. You're just surrounding us the gorillas right now. seconds, the gorillas vanish, absorbed into the wall of green. It's a scenario that repeats itself with maddening frequency. You can see how many gorillas could live in this region and remain unseen because of this dense vegetation. To get a chance to observe them, Maria joins researchers from the Wildlife Conservation Society. I want to know the secrets of their survival and how their society works. If anyone can get close to gorillas, it's this team. So, so we know we're close. Yeah, we're close. Their quest takes place on a small parcel of land on the border of the Republic of the Congo and the Central African Republic. It's a place called Mondika. The research teams here have been so successful in their work that one male gorilla and his family have grown to accept human observers. If they can find them, it's Maria's chance to come face to face with the gorillas of Mondika. How, how big is the range here? It's uh, about 15 square kilometers. And uh, in the range, the same range, we can find about 10 different groups of gorillas. Patrice may know the gorillas here better than anyone. Do you find within that but even he won't venture into the forest without the help of the locals. Bayaka men, once known to the outside world as pygmies. They've walked these forests for centuries and are seasoned trackers. Suddenly, there's a rustle from above. Patrice, yes. what's happening? Wow. It's Kingo, a male gorilla about 32 years old. The grizzled band around his midsection distinguishes him as a male in his prime a silverback. Kingo's coming down. Where Kingo wants to go, he goes and we get out of the way. 160 kilograms of muscle makes an impressive entrance.
King Oya Bole, it's the complete name of King Oya. That means voice. So the heavy voice, Bole, means heavy. It just had Very that extra. Distinct. Yeah, mm. strong man. He's not alone. Gorilla families are harems. One male with as many females as he can attract and keep. The females immediately follow Kingo's lead. There are four females, one with a newborn, two with young sons, and a childless female who joined the group last year. The most conspicuous members of the group are the two young sons. You see, Kusu is coming down. So, can you follow, trying to, like, to provoke Kusu? <laughs> they want to play. Kusu is four years old and tends to dominate his younger brother, who's more apt to play the clown. Only a few western lowland gorillas have ever let humans get this close. The process, known as habituation, took eight years. Researchers used to think that habituating western lowland gorillas was just impossible. The vegetation was too dense. They'd been hunted for centuries, so they would just run at the sight of a human. And here we are, sitting this close to a silverback. But Kingo and his family are not alone in this forest. The Wildlife Conservation Society has discovered that gorillas are living here in unexpected numbers. But determining just how many elusive creatures are here wasn't easy. Max Dimitrov, a WCS forester, takes Morea deeper into the jungle to show how they did it. Immediately, the trackers pick up a gorilla trail. The footprints, the hill, yes, the hill. And you see, if it was going back so it, this, this would be, be backwards yes. but you can tell they're going that way because your heel yeah. would be right there yes and they're able to spot that immediately that's really amazing yeah the Bayaka men have passed their tracking skill down through generations now this talent is a critical factor in gorilla conservation to a Bayaka a turned leaf or this bent twig read like road signs to outsiders like Max and Maria, it borders on the magical. How does he know that they went that way because of the broke, just yes, the yes, leaves the leaf facing down? So yes, sometimes they can see the prints. But right now, how does he, just the leaves moving in that direction? Do, do you see anything there? Here, I can see nothing. I'm glad to hear that, Max, because I don't see anything there but just dirt and leaves. Same as, I, sometimes I can see, but this, this time it's... That's the magic. Yes. The trail leads them directly to what they were looking for. Oh, right here. There's a nest right here. Nests. An unmistakable sign of gorillas. They are the key in determining the number of gorillas living here. Get off the ground and it's padded. They build a mattress of rubbery marantasi leaves, either in the trees or on the ground. One up there. I see it. Yeah. Exploration in the 1990s suggests that this region is precious habitat, teeming with gorillas and worthy of preservation. To prove it, the numbers have to be confirmed. In 2006, researchers from the WCS divide up 46,000 square kilometers of Congo forest. Then they walk sample areas and count every nest they see. From the number of nests, they extrapolate the number of gorillas. Their estimate is staggering. As many as 100,000 gorillas. 
The find effectively doubles the world's known population of this endangered great ape. But this gorilla stronghold could vanish as quickly as it was found. Illegal hunting and logging, as well as outbreaks of disease, threaten the region around Mondika. That makes Kingo and his family ambassadors for conservation as well as scientific subjects. They've only begun to teach us about their society, the way they live, and the way they think. Primatologist Morea Mayer and Wildlife Conservation Society researcher Patrice Mongo catch up with Kingo and his family. They find him deeply engrossed in his favorite pastime, eating. Food is one factor that differentiates western lowlands from other gorilla species. Unlike the mountain gorillas, which we know so much more about, that just sit in this giant salad bowl of a forest eating leaves all day, western lowland gorillas depend much more on fruit. And this is a great time of year when fruits are literally dropping out of the trees and these guys are just feasting on their favorite goodies here. Here's some of that fruit I was mentioning. Kingo and his clan enjoy a lot of variety in their diet. Over 70 kinds of fruit, plus roots and leaves. But they're not pure vegetarians, eagerly munching on termites. A female named Makome digs into a good patch. But Kingo spots her eating. When there's food, it's easy to see who's boss. She immediately gives way. Makome's submission points to a burning question about Western lowland gorilla society. How much power and how much choice do females have within the group? Another female might offer some clues. Ugly. As a young female, her heavy brow and antisocial personality earned her the name Ugly. Ugly is. She's ugly. <laughs> she's uh, poor ugly. <laughs> yeah, she's a little bit aggressive. About ugly, I used to say she doesn't like the human. But now she changed a lot. Now she's, <laughs> the, she's nice. She become nice. Her baby is just four months old. Infant mortality can be as high as 50%. Ugly has suffered the loss of two babies in three years. After that, she drifted away from the group and out of view of the researchers. Ugly is really taking her sweet time deciding whether to stay with Kingo or find another silverback. This year, she rejoined Kingo, and this newborn female appears to be the result. Biologists are still trying to decipher what makes a female choose a particular male. Males themselves aren't that selective. Kingo's always on the lookout to add more females, often luring them away from another silverback. <laughs> Suddenly, he sends a particular male. What's happening? I don't know if you hear another another mm -hmm. name. So that means there is an interaction. We have to be careful. So he heard another male silverback in the distance. Yeah, he became featured. And he just got tensed yeah. up. <laughs> Very yes. tense yes. silverback yes. right now. Yeah. Western lowlands have the largest home territory of any gorilla. Kingo stretches about 10 kilometers. But the boundaries are fluid and overlap with other groups. 
Kingo Hoots has a warning to outside males and an invitation to new females. With what seems like confidence, he moves toward the unseen male. What I'm seeing now, it seems like he was not afraid of this man. It's important for the silverback to hold his ground yeah. and run in the direction of that yeah. sound rather than being afraid and running away. It's dangerous. Another male can kill the infant kill, kill and, the infant and, and start over. Know. It's a standoff, not only between Kingo and the unseen male, but also between Kingo and his own females. Running into another silverback could put their young ones in danger and they want no part of it. But Kingo does not relent. <coughs> he calls out to his females to follow. When the research team catches up, there's nothing to see. If Kingo confronted the other male, it happened too deep in the forest. But now he seems edgy and ready for a conflict. Clearly, the silverback is the dominant member of the group. The charge, while terrifying, is a bluff, a display of his physical power, but it sends a clear message. Clearly, the aggressive dominant male is the leader of the group, and where he wants to go, he goes, and I will clear his way. You know, Kingo is being extremely tolerant, but if he wanted to, he could rip my head off. Any one of us. Strong, strong animal. It can be sort of in the in-between baby to juvenile stage. He doesn't quite know the ropes just yet. Kusu's sort of the troublemaker of the group, but Akindi's not really that innocent. He likes to egg on his, his big brother a lot. Kusu and Akendi are in the process of being weaned. They cling less to their mothers and are fascinated with their father, Kingo. Kingo has this little spot to stop while he waits for the females. And as usual, his two young sons are close by him. And they're at the right age where they seem to spend a lot of time with the father. They still haven't got quite the hang of it yet. Kusu and Akendi are beginning to learn the ways of a silverback. Even if it means interrupting their dad's nap. They mimic their father's tree-shaking displays in their own exuberant way. For the most part, their antics are tolerated, though even Kingo has a limit. We're so lucky that Kingo is trusting us to get this close, just a few feet away from his two young sons. I mean, this is really, really special. The females seem intent on keeping on the move. The trackers suspect they're heading for a swampy section of forest they call the bongo. Kingo has another direction in mind. 
It appears he'll force the females into following him again. out a distress call and Kingo rushes in to protect his family. But when the tracking team catches up, the females are calm and there's no sign of a problem. Apparently nothing at all is wrong. The females seem to have found a way to get the big silver back to follow them. Researchers have always tended to focus on the males because they are the aggressive ones. It's only been in recent years that the question of female choice has come into the spotlight. Do the females have a voice within this group? But that was very, very tricky of the female to let out the scream in the direction of the swamps. And well, what are we going to do now, ladies? Going in the swamps. And wherever they lead, Morea and the Wildlife Conservation Society team must keep up. That's not going to work, is it? That's not a good step. That's not a good step. <laughs> yeah, we're in the swamps. <sighs> It's really difficult to get your balance when you're walking through these swamps, so just out of instinct, you go to grab the first branch that's nearest you so you don't fall in everything nasty you can find in the swamp. I mean, the, the bugs bite more, the, the thorns are bigger. And not to mention the diseases that are in the water, the nasty little bugs that you can't see that you're ingesting. Mencari yang halal? Kunjungi Mihas 2012 Pameran Perdagangan Halal Antarabangsa dari 4 hingga 7 April 2012 di Pusat Convention Kuala Lumpur Untuk maklumat lanjut, layari halal.com.my Terkikitkah? Jari jemari yang menyuapkan kita. Oh, I have about a thousand of these little biting red ants in my hair. Ow! Ah. Oh, nice. Today is special mud bath. Food is probably what draws them here. In particular, Kangwasika, a highly nutritious plant that only grows in swampy clearings. This resource may be more important to the females than to Kingo. As the dominant leader, he eats first, even when food is scarce. The females don't always get enough, so coming to the swamp may help guarantee a square meal for them and their young. Kingo's leaving the swamp, which is great because everything nasty is in the swamp. I'm with Kingo on this one, sorry ladies. But getting out of the mud doesn't mean they're out of danger. On the path home, they surprise one of the biggest creatures in the jungle. A bull-forced elephant. If the Bayaka men fear one thing, this is it. Elephants kill many Bayaka. Go, 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 come on, come on, go, go, go!
they run extremely fast and they can get around these trees much better than we can. It looks like the elephant's now gone that way. Luckily camp is that way. <sighs> As evening descends, Kingo's clan settles down for the night. Maria has seen the silverback's bluster, but also his tolerance. And she's seen how the females can influence his leadership. But still the picture is incomplete. With such a dense population of gorillas here, different groups often run into each other. Mandika's thick forest prevents seeing what happens when they do. There's another study that could provide the missing piece of the puzzle, where Morea can see what happens when gorillas face off. At first look, the Congo Basin appears as an unbroken expanse of green. A hundred thousand gorillas could easily disappear in this forest. But a closer look reveals a surprising natural feature. Wide marshy clearings, which the local people call bais. They are wildlife magnets, drawing animals of all stripes into close contact. One such buy is the site of another Wildlife Conservation Society research center. Here, Dr. Thomas Brewer keeps a watchful eye and camera lens on the inhabitants. Forest elephants, Sidatunga, primates of all kinds. But it's the gorillas who are making news. They come here by the dozen, drawn in by abundant food and possibly each other. In 2003, Brewer recorded an historic moment, something no wild gorilla had ever been witness doing, making and using a tool. Primatologist Maria Mayer is eager to see these famous gorillas for herself. Bai is the longest term study of western lowland gorillas and it's the perfect setting to observe their lives day to day, their interactions with other groups that you're not able to see in the forest and together it makes up the entire picture of this very mysterious gorilla. All study at Mbeli Bai takes place from an observation platform. It affords a great view of the action at a discreet distance. This place is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like it, yeah. It's so pristine here. How many gorilla groups do you get here normally? At the moment, you have some 14 groups, and then you have uh, solitary males. So in total, maybe 140 gorillas. Wow. And you can recognize all of the gorillas that come in here? It takes a while, but um, after three months, I mean, they become faces. I mean. They're like you and me, they're so distinctive. Where Mandika provided a close-up of one family, Mbeli Bai offers a wide-angle view of many groups. Today, the Bai is dominated by a large silverback named George. So that's George? Yeah, and he's together with a female that you might have heard about. Uh, she's also just coming in with her her daughter, and uh, she's called Leah. And, and she's uh, the famous tool-using gorilla. That's, that's exactly her, yeah. One day in 2003, Leah quietly steps into the bai and surprises the world. Thomas is watching for a sequel to these dramatic events. He thinks it's likely that if gorillas are using tools here, they're also doing it deep in the forest, beyond the gaze of human observers. Right now, at Mbele Bai, there's no need for such ingenuity. 
Noclea fruit, a gorilla favorite, is ripe and abundant. On the marshy ground, Tanguasica is available by the handful. Mbeli is a bit like a town square, where females can size up available males, and males can size up the competition. At the moment, Leah's mate George is sharing the spotlight with a rival, an equally large male named Bayleaf. This is the very behavior that Maria couldn't see in the deep forest. Two silverbacks squaring off. They stand stiff-armed, flexing like two bodybuilders. Fighting is rare, but if one of them looks weak, his females might be tempted to switch to the more appealing male. It's interesting how the silverbacks tend to relax a bit more once the female has a baby, because then they're ultimately more dependent on him. But females without young are less faithful. And one of Bayleaf's females appears to be checking George out. So she's a bigger flight risk because she doesn't have to depend on him. She's free agent. She can choose to move to another group. Look, look oh. at Bayleaf. Wow. Wow, he really came down on that female. Wow, yeah, yeah. It's a reminder, you're with me and, and keeping and her in behave. that group and better yeah. behave. Yeah, no, definitely. It's not known whether such aggression keeps a female in the group or drives her away. It's an interesting thing that it brings up, the question of female choice. Is that something that they want this very strong male to herd them back in or is it something that actually they think if the opportunity arises, perhaps I should go to a, another silverback? I think for the female it would make sense to choose the aggressive male because he will be good in protecting uh, her babies. But that's because you're a guy that you think. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more to learn about the rules of attraction. Mbeli Bai is the perfect place to see what it takes for a silverback to stand out in the crowd. <laughs> The mysteries of western lowland gorillas don't reveal themselves overnight, but over generations. Gorillas live to be 40 or more. The Wildlife Conservation Society's Mbeli Bai project is in its 17th year. Gorillas who were infants when the project began are now reaching breeding age. A lone male named Saha was first observed as a juvenile. Now he's 19. We know Saha since the start of the study in uh, 95 and uh, he's been solitary for like two or three years. So he's just at that point where he's going to be acquiring females soon. I think he needs some time more to fully develop. He, he's kind of well built but there's something extra missing and whether he will get the females or not then we will see but some don't, don't even get females at all. <laughs> Saha serves as a perfect case study for uncovering what makes one gorilla more attractive than another. Bayleaf, the big silverback, arrives in the bai. In every sense, Saha appears outclassed. I mean, you see his crest is kind of flat and yeah. it's still growing. Thomas believes that the critical factor in courting is the crest. Bayleaf's rusty crown of bone, fat, and muscle is like a beacon to females. Saha's flat top just can't compete. Is he so, getting worried that his group is now coming in? I mean, Well, Saha? I would be worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big Bayleaf silverback. Is, is, is one of the biggest. Bested by the larger male, he withdraws from center stage. But his troubles are not over. There are in total nine males. So it's a bachelor group. Yeah. A 
group of rowdy young teenagers enters from the south. See how they are walking with this stiff limb posture? Yes. They're going to be tough guys now, yeah, are yeah, they? Yeah. Zaha won't be intimidated. No females are at stake here. This is about showing who's tougher. Oh, that's not fair. Yeah, he's so outnumbered. Well, but he's bigger. The largest male in the group is Rudy. He's a blackback, mature, but not old enough to have developed the silver band. Rudy and his gang taunt and threaten Saha. Confrontations usually resolve without violence, but Rudy has numbers on his side, and that raises the stakes. Wow! Wow! Whoa! What? In the skirmish, Saha lands a bite on Rudy's shoulder. The bachelor gang's tough attitude evaporates. Rudy, shoulder bleeding, slinks off. For Saha, a victory like this provides experience and may propel him toward becoming a viable silverback. An afternoon shower diffuses the tension. But it does seem like the vibe becomes more alive with the rain. Suddenly more animals start to wander in and it's, it's yeah. quite beautiful. Gorillas seem to enjoy the rain. It cools the air and drives insects away. They can spend hours in the rain. I've seen like a visit, eight hours. Wow. They're feeding a lot. Seasons in the Congo rainforest have less to do with weather and more to do with changing food supply. The Naklia fruit that drew gorillas to the bai is almost gone. When food gets short, tempers flare. When females like these clash, it's usually two within the same group. And the trigger is often food. Scientists are still uncertain whether the females follow a pecking order within the group. Now, in your experience, is one of those females more dominant than the other? I think from the work we've been doing here, it's really difficult to make a clear conclusion. It seems like that's just one of the other mysteries surrounding these gorillas is we don't know whether there's a clear dominance hierarchy in, in the females. Yeah. They know competition between different groups exists. What they don't know is how much goes on within a group. Some familiar females might shed light on the issue. Females have to compromise. In gaining the silverback's protection, they relinquish some, but apparently not all, social power. Still, they're the ones that choose or refuse a mate, perhaps the ultimate power in guerrilla society. As for Kingo, he has the authority to lead the group to the next food resource. Pancovia, one of their favorite fruits, is ripe. But just because he gets them to the tree doesn't mean he has to share. That's where his power comes in. Even Kusu, the future of Kingo's line, is not guaranteed a meal. It's another difficult lesson in the social hierarchy.
If Kusu becomes a breeding silverback, then he will have the pick of the food. But that privilege is some 14 years away. Wildlife Conservation Society will continue to follow the evolving story of Kingo's family and of their brethren at Mbeli Bai. The insight these gorillas have offered so far is groundbreaking. They reveal a complex society where females balance the silverback's authority with their own subtle power. And they are assuming a place as tool users alongside humans and other great apes. These few gorillas have revealed their secrets so that a hundred thousand others might keep theirs. In seclusion, there is survival. That survival depends, as it always has, on the forest that's sheltered them through the ages and on the people who have been the stewards of this land for just as long. You realize just how deep and hidden into the African forest gorillas have had to go. Here, this far, this remote, they've been able to hide out. And this Eden, this is their safe haven. <laughs> 